Hello and welcome to Tantas Talk, the world's only English language program focusing primarily on Hungarian folk music. My name is Kalman Magyar Öcsi, speaking to you from Toronto, Canada. Episodes of Tansas Talk, combining a mix of music and stories delivered by myself, are available as always on tanshaz.com, that's T-A-N-C-H-A-Z.com, or on YouTube. Just search Tansas Talk and subscribe uh, so you don't miss any of these episodes. Uh, today, we have an episode of Tansas Talk Interviews. This is the series where I delve into long-form interviews with a wide array of guests. Episodes of Tansas Talk interviews are available on all popular podcast platforms, including Google, Spotify, Apple, and all those, whatever, your favorite podcast stores. And make sure you subscribe and leave a nice review if you like what you hear. Today I'm going to change it up a bit. Today is an on-the-road episode uh, recorded on the road in the car, uh, traveling with Gabor Dobi and Attila Krosnoi uh, on the way uh, to Ottawa, uh, driving from Toronto uh, to play for the wonderful Ottawa Hungarian community. This is not the usual interview uh, type of series. Um, here we're kind of using our time wisely while on the road with Gabor and Attila. Uh, quick uh, intro on Gabor Dobi, or Gobi as we call him. He was born in 1970, grew up in the Toronto Hungarian folk dance uh, community uh, as a member of the Kodai Dance Ensemble. Uh, later, during his college years, he danced for a few years with the Tamboritsins of Duquesne University, which is the most famous uh, uh, Central Eastern European um, uh, folk dance troupe uh, uh, formed in 1937 uh, operating out of Duquesne University as it was then. Now things have kind of changed with the group but uh, Gobi and I spent two years in the Tamburitsins together. Uh, when he returned uh, he, uh, to Toronto he continued working with Kodai and also uh, founded the Ketchkesem, uh, a music group which uh, focused on Moldva and Gimesh uh, type of music, music of the Changos. Uh, he moved to Hungary for several years, um, danced there. We'll talk a bit about that with him. And we came back. When he came back, uh, he he's uh, ever since then uh, continuing to work uh, with Kodai. Uh, he has two daughters who uh, who live in Germany with their mom. And uh, while Gobi likes to say he works in a warehouse, he's actually the supervisor of operations for a giftware company. Um, Attila Krosnoi. Attila was born in 1966 uh, in Székesfehérvár, Hungary, is where he grew up. That's about an hour outside of Budapest. Uh, he uh, was playing guitar, picked up the bass, uh, and was uh, a member of the Tilinko dance, or excuse me, Tilinko music group, which toured in North America in 1988 and 1990 and before then he actually uh, performed in Drummondville Festival as well in Quebec. Um, he loved uh, Canada uh, and uh, moved here uh, to Canada in the early 1990s. Um, after living a bit all over the place in Canada uh, he kind of landed in Toronto and uh, and played with the Fekete Föld band uh, and then was, became a founding member of the Jonta Hungarian folk band, um, which I am in as well. Uh, now Attila lives in um, St. Catharines, Ontario, about an hour and a half away from Toronto by the Ni in the Niagara Falls region uh, of Ontario. And uh, for his day job, he's a car salesman, uh, motor vehicle dealer salesman. Um, he's quite modest, but actually this guy knows everything about cars and uh, he's, he's actually a brilliant salesman. Um, he has uh, two children, um, uh, both of whom happen to have kids, so he's actually a grandfather of two at a quite a young age. Um, so here's our interview uh, or a discussion, I would say, on the road with Gabi, Dobi Gabi, excuse me, Gabi, Gabor, Dobi Gabi, and Krasnoi Attila. We are on Route 401. This is the big highway that connects. Uh, I guess Ottawa or Montreal to Toronto and beyond. We are in a my white Subaru car, and as usual, the bass player Attila 
is driving and Dobby Gobby sitting in the back where he belongs, in the back seat next to the base, all curled up. And uh, it's slightly snowing and it's Saturday morning, it's one degree Celsius. So, and we are doing our drive to uh, Ottawa to play at the uh, Hungarian house, the Hungarian Cultural Center in Ottawa with our band Yonta and Gobi will be dancing as usual with the band. I want to ask about your early Tansas memories uh, growing up in Toronto as you did. Um, I guess we're going into the 80s uh, and, and what do you remember in terms of your first exposure and experiences with the, uh, with the Tansas? Well, I think I think we always wanted to have Tansas in the 80s. I think it was something that we aspired to. Uh, it's just that the bands back then who who existed in Toronto weren't, I wouldn't say they weren't comfortable with playing Tansas. It's just, it, it just wasn't something that was that was done. So, so I think maybe in the 80s, maybe there was like maybe three or four like the whole decade, there were like three or four times that we had Tansaz. There was one interesting Tansaz that I really, really um, enjoyed um, because they put so much effort into it. Um, Wally and Sue uh, organized, I think, or, or could have been, I, maybe Kaman was, was was a part of it as well. But Dreisigat Kaman, but but they they organized this Tansaz where they they included. Um, they included material, uh, reading material as well, uh, of, of the dances that were being taught. So it was, it was, it was a very, um, very multimedia oriented tansas where there was a lot of um, different, th different things that were offered, which was good because, because, um, because people weren't really aware of uh, what the dances were that were danced necessarily as we are today. Um, and uh, and it, it was a really well organized tansas uh, in that way. Although I'm not sure if the actual tansas was was as energetic and dynamic as the tansas that exist today. Uh, there was one tansas that I organized, um, and I, <laughs> I still have the tape, and I haven't given it back to you yet. Uh, it was it was 1989. I mean, I organized is probably a little bit of an overstatement because because although my name was 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 as the as the main organizer of the Tansas I was still you know pretty young I was 19 years old so I was given a lot of support uh, by by the uh, the members of Kodai like Mike Wagner Gabe Wagner Chaba so they 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 were prob they probably did more of the organizing than I did I was just I was just uh, you know, I, I, I mean I did some of the organizing but uh, but they they helped me a lot uh, and that's when I called uh, called you guys to to come up and and uh, play a tansas for us uh, and and I thought it was uh, kind of cool and that was still in the 80s too that was 1989 yeah. specifically right before New Year's when it turned into the next decade and I, I, I have really really great memories of that tansas and I thought it was an excellent tansas and I thought it was like right at the cusp of getting into the the sort of newer, newer type of tans houses that happened in the '90s, where where it was really, really, um, people began to really get to know the the different dialects, and 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 I think it, it helped that we we had the symposiums uh, that kind of prepared us uh, with with all the different material out there. Uh, fun tidbit: I think that's where I met my uh, my now wife Trixie in the uh, the basement there of the. Uh, Hungarian house, the old Hungarian house on St. Clair in Toronto. So Eletfa, that was, we made, I think we made several trips up here at that time. We became kind of the house band for the Tanz houses, including Pontozo 90, uh, right? I think as well. Um, yeah, those were some, there's a very, I just remember the scene up here in Toronto was very, very energetic and we really loved playing for you guys. And I think that's where kind of the love, of, love affair between between uh, New Jersey, uh, New York, and, and and Toronto, that real brotherhood uh, became established. Yeah, yeah. No, that was that was a great time period, and we were at the right age for that to happen as well. And and there were a lot of things that uh, came out of that. Uh, I, I also want to say that a little bit later on, although Fekatafield existed in North America for a long time, um, I only sort of um, uh, brought them into the scene 
or became comfortable with them a little bit later on as far as uh, tan sizes go. Uh, they they played a lot of tan sizes for us a little bit later on, like in the in the late '90s and early 2000s, when when we had our band Kechkamit. But maybe we can talk about that later. Kechkamit, Kechkasem, Kechkamit Ferry, Kechkasem. But but we, those those were some interesting tan sizes too, where we brought in different bands, uh, different um, nationality bands like Croatia, uh, uh, Polish bands. So that, those were interesting tan sizes too. Yeah, so Attila, you were, uh, uh, by the way, if you hear the little cracking in the back, that is heavy snow now. Are, are we on to hail, Attila? What is this? Uh, something. So, something like that. Yeah, so uh, no snow tires yet because the snow is coming out of nowhere. Because it's the fall. Because it's yeah. still the fall. <laughs> yes. Yeah, snow tire installation is in two weeks from now. So, but that's okay. It's a Subaru. It's all wheel drive. It's safe. So, and Attila's flying at 112 kilometers an hour. Oh, slowing down to 110, this is exciting. It's like a Formula One race. <laughs> so Attila, um, uh, when I first met you, 1988, is when Tilinko, your band in, from Seika Shvehirvar, first came here. I remember the first year, that that, that was a, quite a hiccupy uh, trip. Uh, do you remember with the visa situation and you guys arrived late to, uh, yeah, uh, to, to that? I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Said it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, we were supposed to be at a camp, right? In, um, what was it, Penn? West Virginia, yeah. West Virginia, yeah. And uh, obviously we arrived late. And on top of it, when we arrived, I believe it was also the evening time. So everybody was already just, you know, waiting for the band. <laughs> and of course, I, at least myself, I felt like I was, uh, I had a hangover, you know, after flying out because we flew through, I think, Swiss Air, uh, from Switzerland, and then of course drove up from uh, Tinek, right? Tinek. Yeah, yeah. Tinek, yeah. Uh, with a van, right? And um, yeah. That was the year there was a, some visa situation, visa complications getting you guys here. And so Eilat Fall played the first few days of the camp, and I think that I see a Kalman taught. Uh, and then when you guys arrived with Botu and Fetchka, uh, the camp went on. Gobi, were you there? I was there. Those, those two symposiums, the '88 and the '90 symposium, were like one of my, one of my favorite symposiums. So Attila, when you arrived, I mean, you guys had been playing already in the Hungarian, uh, Hungary proper Tansa scene. What, what, what did you? What were your initial thoughts, or if you could recall, it was a long time ago, but you know, your your uh, your observations on what was going on here at that time. Well, for me, personally, it was super interesting uh, just to see how everybody is involved, how much energy they had. Um, oops. Well, it's really wow. snowing <laughs> and it's icy. It's crazy. Now we're slowing down. Oh, man. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. fall in, uh, in Ontario. Yeah. Good. Yeah, but it, it, it was very interesting for me. And then... Um, just as a footnote, you know, as you mentioned, coming from Seikashvahirva, right? Uh, Tanzhaz is there most of the time. We are talking hundreds of people, right? Wow. So, like um, an Easter Tanzhaz, we had six, seven hundred people. Uh, generally, maybe half of that at a normal Tanzhaz. And most people came. Back then in Hungary, Tanzhazes were not every day at different locations. In Sekesfehirvar, there was a, every other week on a Saturday, there was a Tanzhaz. Therefore, people from Budapest and all surrounding cities were coming in. So it gave all that energy and everybody just wanted to be there. And it's interesting, uh, Gobi mentioned one of the Tanzhazes he really liked had not just dancing, but it was more like a multimedia kind of thing. So it also happened in the early Tansas is that the local uh, poets, for example, you know, came and, and, and in the breaks, you know, when the band stopped, um, they, I guess they um, showed what they wrote, you know, or what, and uh, there was all kinds of other things going on at the same time because of course, back then, for me at least, 
Um, we were learning as we were playing, you know, all the uh, original recordings were still on tapes, uh, reel-to-reel tapes, right? Yeah. So we were spending times on, you know, transferring them to cassettes and then learning it. And then, of course, shortly after, say three days later, we played it in a dance house, right? Uh, for folks who didn't actually knew. <laughs> There's a sticky situation here. Isn't yeah, it? we were kind of. Yeah. This is really an on the road episode here. Exactly. Right, so she's wearing gloves and a mask. That's very good. Yeah, and she's well, alone in the car. The next one has to be a video, right? Um, thankfully, uh, Richie has the Subaru, so this is pretty cool. <laughs> but uh, hey, the trucker is going, so it's fine. Yeah, so it was very interesting for me, all the people. And the other thing was interesting that I don't particularly remember in that camp, but generally when we were out here in, in North America playing first time, that a lot of people were interested who had no roots in Hungarian um, at all, like they weren't even second, third generation, anything like that, but they were interested in so-called international dancing, right? right? right. Yeah, was what was the draw, what was the draw to people coming to Székesfehérvár, which is about an hour of drive or so outside of Budapest, hour and a half or hour-ish? Yeah, um, it was a very popular dance house. And in fact, in Székesfehérvár, when I was there a couple of years ago, I saw t literally the building is called the dance house, I think. Um, I saw a street sign saying dance house to the left, um, which is pretty cool. What's the, what was the draw? What were you guys doing, aside from this, perhaps a multimedia thing that, that made it such a popular destination for people to come from Budapest and beyond to see you guys? I think back then it was definitely self-organized. So it wasn't really an official dance has. We were the ones who actually made the, we used to put out, you know, little pieces of paper on the walls, you know, at the bus stations and all over the place uh, to let people know that it's gonna happen. And sometimes also the theme of the dance has, if, it, if there was. Um, and the main reason why it was so popular in there, I think, because they started uh, early on um, these weekends workshop, weekend workshops, right? Uh, in Sekesh mm -hmm. So they were teaching actual the instrument playing, right? How it differs from classical and so on. Um, and of course, um, in Sekesh Fahirvar, they were teaching the teachers, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so it was. I guess that was one of the main reasons. And as I mentioned, there wasn't m that many places to to get together and do these dance house and a party. Um, and it, how would I put it? Of course it was going on and it was getting bigger and bigger, but it was not um, as supported by the government per se, right? And because, as I mentioned, it was something new to us. Uh, of course, anybody who were young, you know, and got bit by this bug, <laughs> were uh, there for life, pretty much, right? Yeah. And it's still is it still going on every other week there in Sekeshreva? Do you know? Um, not as much as far as I know, but they still have dance houses in Fahirvar. And as Uchi mentioned, uh, there is a dedicated building now in Sekeshreva called Dance House. And it has all kinds of different functions beside that, of course. Um, they have a great big archive of, you know, field recordings. And, uh, of course, as I mentioned, they are teaching the teachers, right? Right. Um, Gobi, do you remember listening to these initial, the first Tilinko CD? Do you remember? Um, the first Tilinko oh, CD? Like the, yeah, or CD tape, I guess, back then. I, I, I just, I remember the the band that like there was so because I, I up until then we had had daily bob here uh 1984 1986 uh, tilinko really was a next level up in terms of their arrangements and this focus on dunantul music was very very cool <laughs> yeah 
I don't know if you remember those old recordings. They're uh, unbelievably. Yeah, yeah, of course. I love I love the Tilinko tapes that that I bought at the at symposium. So, uh, yeah, it was it was amazing. Yeah, no, it's really uh, you, the band was very very good, and. In fact, I think I mean when you left, you left them until uh, I guess early '90s. Um, aside from you, I think the band was is still pretty much the same setup, right? Uh, the Knefel brothers and Varo Yoni and Paul Garzoli, right? And then yeah. who did they get to replace you? What bass players? Uh, there was a fellow who uh, I went to actual to study classical bass you know at uh, the local music school and uh, he at the local music school they actually had an established folk symphony or folk band you know almost like a symphony orchestra but they paid played um, arrangements right of, uh, of folk music and he played in there and of course um, we invited him to different places because as you remember, between 1988 and 90, the two times we were out in North America, I was drafted. So I was in the army. Oh, I thought you drafted in the NFL. <laughs> yeah, well, that would have been a little different. I was drafted in the army, so uh, he did some of the dance houses, right? Wow. When I couldn't get out uh, for that weekend. And uh, that's how it started. And he's stuck and he's still there. What's his name? Balaj. Just Bolaj? I like that. He's South American. <laughs> yeah, he's got one. <laughs> Neymar Jr. <laughs> so now, uh, just so we get a sense, uh, the roads are getting quite sticky with snow. And Attila is, uh, now he's got 10, he's doing 10 and 2 on the steering wheel, or 9 and 3. Yeah, 10 and 2 was in the past. And, we, and, and <laughs> we've only slid once so far, which is pretty good. So just, uh, we, we, we hopefully arrive in one piece. Um, Gubby, you, uh, you, I know you have a bit of a, a fixation or a fascination with uh, Gimesh music um, and dance. What is the that drives you to that material so much? Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's um, it has something to do with the fact that it's uh, I don't know what the the best uh, descriptor would be for it, but maybe primordial. Mm. Uh, there's there's there there isn't really a uh, it's not very melodic. Uh, I think that's that's the um, criticism that that a lot of people say about it. Although you know, if if you play some of the chad dashes, then then it becomes a little bit more melodic. Um, but but it's it's violin and uto gordon, so it's 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 a pretty basic setup. Um, so you don't have you don't have the um, layered uh, harmonies that you would get from a from a Kalota Sagi or even a Mezoshigi, but obviously our Kishmaryoro Sagi would be even more complex in that way. Um, it's just it's just that when you hear that music and and you get into the zone as a dancer, uh, it can be it can be pretty um, it can be pretty meditative in a way. But it it it, it makes you it makes you focus when you're when you're um, stomping on the ground because uh, Dimash is about that. Uh, and and there's a there's an energy that kind of drives drives your dance and and in a way the Dimashi dance isn't as complex as as a mezzo shigi or a kalota sagi with all the turns and all the interesting um, figures uh, but but it's it's an incredibly hard dance to master and and there's an energy that I get from it when I dance it obviously I'm you know nowhere near uh, to dancing it like it should be danced but but when I dance and when I when I when I stomp, especially when I stomp, when I get drunk, I, I stomp to all the different dances that are being played, <laughs> and it's I'm sure pretty pretty annoying to everyone, but but it's 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 the energy that you 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 get from the music that makes you makes you want to do do that type of dance. I think is is what it is. Yeah, I I, I really don't enjoy listening to it, to be honest. I like playing it. I think it's very exciting yeah, to play, That's yeah. Exciting. But listening to it, I don't know. Maybe it's because it's not melodic or harmonic enough. You know, it's, it's just really one lead instrument with the percussion instrument. Attila, do you like to listen to Dimash? Uh, when I play the garden, it's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> and actually, Gabi's right. For me, it is like um, you get into that zone, 
it, it is almost like you know you're meditating yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but obviously lately we don't play too much you know for that length of time but in 1990 when we came with Jura oh that's right the oh, yeah. G-Mesh was it the was, material yeah, it yeah, was yeah, yeah. G-Mesh yeah. so I pretty much played the garden for you know a week day and night mm -hmm. and uh, yeah it's definitely that you just get into that zone and the primordial bit is interesting, and and um, where I the, I the one exception is where when the Zerkula band came, the six the six youths, mm -hmm. <laughs> the six youths from uh, from the Dimash area, um, five violins and a Gordon player. That that was all over the, uh, the the February weekend workshop. That really stuck. I remember that memory. Yeah, that, that, they're really good, actually. They're really good, and just having five was very exciting. But when it's really good, it's really good. Yeah. I, desi it, I designed their um, uh, CD cover. <laughs> oh yeah? yeah. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's that's cool. Yeah. I mean, when I think of Gimesh, I'll think of them and you, Gobi, and and, <laughs> and Krupi for some reason too. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Attila, what uh, playing playing Gordon is a challenge physically. Uh, I, I'm sure for a whole week, but but um, uh, playing the bass when I play the bass, which is a rarity, thank God, uh, it's physically very taxing on me. And I remember I talked to you about that, and you said, well, one of the secrets to playing the bass is the proper physical physical setup and how you hold the instrument. Maybe you can talk a bit about that, and uh, and and maybe share some secrets or tips of of longevity. <laughs> you know, after ten minutes. I got get a cramp. What do you? How are you dealing with that physically in terms of playing the bass for so long? Uh, playing the bass for so long. Well, we have to separate, I guess, from classical and the uh, and the folk playing. Um, the folk playing is quite different. Of course, in the villages, some people played bass who was either a family member, you know or because he was big enough to carry the instrument and stuff like that. <laughs> of course, there were some fantastic bass players, but but most of the time. Um, but if you do have the proper uh, stand, the proper positioning, just like in a violin playing, right? Um, with the bass, then you are not using um, really much of your small muscles and you know your wrists and so on and so on you are actually using your big back muscle you know and and actually the the momentum of your right hand right so it's like a pendulum mm -hmm. instead of trying to use your muscles mm -hmm. um and uh now as we can see all the bass players the hungarian in hungary right they all classically trained so on so on right and they all go back to playing uh, with the German holding of the bow, right? Uh, because you are able to, uh, I guess, bring out a bigger sound out of the bass than using it the so-called French bow, right? Which uh, pretty much most of the villages were using uh, in original recordings. Um, and where that style is coming from, of course, it's coming from, we know that, because all this playing is based on the the Renaissance times um, and on the bass they stuck with using gut strings just like in the old days so they had two possibly three strings you know depends on how much money and and <laughs> style they played uh, but yeah definitely uh, it worth a lot uh, it's worth anybody's while if you are getting into bass playing to study a little bit the positioning and how to actually use the bass classically from the classic. Yeah, it's not about like I guess it's so you're saying it's not about pushing, and uh, it, it's more about the using your body, the natural momentum of it, um, and pulling almost instead of pushing, uh, right? I mean, it's kind of like the same thing, it's similar to violin. Um, interesting. I've been going to a chiropractor for some tune-ups every six weeks and. Uh, uh, for in the summer when I didn't play at all violin because uh, there's nothing going on um, I was like really straight my neck was fine and then I went back after oh, some long weekend we were playing 
and uh, I, I happened to have my appointment right after that. And she's like, oh, I can tell the difference. You've been playing, and she, you know, it's, it's really good, which is very interesting. Yeah. And, I, and I showed her my, my left thumb, and I said, I've been playing the gordon too. No, I'm just kidding. She said, what's a garden? <laughs> so we, we, uh, the snow is, is uh, still falling a bit, still a bit uh, icy, but we're, I think we're getting, we just passed some accidents. <laughs> This is very exciting. People parked in the ditch. Yeah, people were parked in the ditch. Yeah, I, I was not expecting this type of weather in November uh, out here, to be honest. But it's really bad. But so, Gobi, you lived in uh, Hungary for several years, several years ago, um, and then you danced as well in the Sent and the dance group that was uh, or is still, I guess, directed by Fitoš Dejer, Kočišanike. What was that? What was that like dancing? I mean, you, uh, you talked about the '80s and '90s uh, here, your experiences, but then, uh, then you were, uh, then you were dancing there and performing on stage in Hungary. I remember ac even seeing you doing a kolotosegi choreography. What was what was your experience there? Well, um, I think I think when I I moved to Hungary, my my life uh, was a little bit different. Uh, I was a little bit older. Uh, uh, my my kids were just born. So, so my my time that I was able to spend uh, on dancing was was quite limited, and when I did join Santa Andra, I was probably uh, until the other guy left. I was I was the second oldest in the group, and when the guy left, I was I was the oldest. And uh, there was one time when Enika was was like really yelling at the group and and saying stuff like, uh, uh, "You should you should." Give me respect. I'm older than all of you. And then I put up my hand and said, you know, I'm, I'm older than you, Anika. And, and she got really pissed off of at me. <laughs> but, Is that uh, when you left? <laughs> that, that's when I left. <laughs> On, yeah, you asked to leave. Involuntarily. Um, I actually really, really, really enjoyed uh, dancing with, uh, with uh, Santandra. It was a really great group. It was it was completely different from what it is now. It's now obviously it became it became a, a professional group, um, and it's not really the Santander group that became prof professional. It's the Fitoš Deja group that became professional. But whatever. But uh, right after I left Santander, it became a little bit of a feeder group for the professional groups. Uh, but 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 before that, it was it was composed of a lot of different. Uh, interesting characters in the group and and I think that's what made it really interesting because it wasn't just about uh, dancers coming there and then and then you know furthering their professional dance career it was about people who were uh, engineers doctors lawyers and also other other um, people with different professions who were there uh, who, who came to the group just because they were interested in the dancing and that's what made it interesting because because it was just a, a diversity of uh, a diversity of people who were there and and the characters who were there were just incredible like Choka Balazic and 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 I can I can name a whole Marzi I can name a, a whole slew of them and and it looked really good on stage just because of the the different characters who were who were part of the group. Um, obviously, it's 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 a different group now. The the their their quality of dancing is just incredible. Um, we I wouldn't be able to keep up with it uh, for what it is now. And thank thankfully, uh, the Santander group was where it was at when I was there. I was able to to join it, um, but. Uh, but yeah, it was it was it was an interesting experience. Uh, what years were you in Hungary? Uh, 2000, 2006 to about two thousand fifteen, something like that. Okay. Um, Fitoš Deje, of course, very very noted. We, I'd have him on the show, but he doesn't speak a lick of English. But uh, but uh, what what was it like working under his tutelage um, and that, and that intensity and the brilliance of his choreographies? It must have been something, huh? Well, it was a lot of fun because we would go out. Um, we would go out to the bar after because this was before they had kids, so so they were able to um, spend a little bit more time with us, and and we would we would talk about the shows. Uh, people would 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 share opinions. I would share my opinion because I was really um, uh, uh, excited about doing stuff like that and and talking about that kind of stuff, and and the creative process was was 
was a shared process. It was really interesting. They were really open to, to asking about different ideas. And then, of course, them sharing their ideas because, because they had these, these incredible, like, really complex ideas about certain things. Like, we, we did, a, we did a, 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 an outlaw outlaw dance what do they say that how, how do they Bet say that? Bet yeah. Yeah. right for, for so, as opposed to the in-laws <laughs> yeah outlaws. show good <laughs> so we did we did an outlaw show and, and they constructed this wagon but the wagon had different functions like there were so many different things that you could do with this wagon and that's the other thing there were there were people there who could who could build this for them so that's why it was so interesting like like the the people there were were part of the whole process in in not just the dancing but but preparing the the set design preparing the music like like people drew things for them so it was it was just an incredible experience um and and i remember the bet we were we were practicing seven days a week um on the weekends we were practicing from nine o'clock in the morning to ten o'clock at night uh it, it became a little bit much because people weren't professional dancers, obviously, and they had other lives, or especially me, who had two kids. Uh, it was it was incredibly tough, and and uh, I think that performance kind of um, hurt the group a little bit. But uh, but it was still like the the experience that that I had with with that group was 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 awesome. Um, I <laughs> just. You hear that? Uh, that's just exciting. Hey, by the way, I see the sun's uh, going to shine soon. Yeah, sons and daughters. And, um, and uh, except uh, Attila insists on uh, taking the car for a, a spin, literally. No, I'm just kidding. Attila's but the best driver. Oh, uh, uh, that was pretty exciting. There, there was one time we, Amikor, uh, There was one time when we were doing the Minoshulesh, uh, which uh, I guess that's uh, a way to. Uh, in order to get funding, you have to get a certain amount of points during this um, it's like accreditation process. Accreditation yeah. process, yes. Uh, and uh, and the Santander group was was doing this. And w when we were performing, that's that's the day, or not the day, but the day after my my um, my second uh, daughter was born. <laughs> and I had this uh, specific thing that I had to do during the performance. When uh, Aji uh, opened the door, I was supposed to be there and and say something or whatever. I don't I don't remember exactly. But I wasn't there, and and it was it was really uncomfortable. And Deja thought that we weren't going to get the accreditation for it because of me, and and um, the fact that that you know my second born uh, came the day before. I think he he let it slide. But we got obviously obviously sent and I got the accreditation. Um, postscript, I guess uh, earlier this year, Fitosh Deja Tarshulat, which is a spin-off, as you say. Of, of Santendre and Lipento, I guess. Yeah, yeah. They the Lipento, which is the Dior based ensemble, um, uh, they 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 became professionally accredited, meaning they are one of the four professional Hungarian dance groups, so full time government paid uh, uh, dance groups, and um, might be the most exciting one coming up. Um, we shall see. But now they have the Hungarian State Folk Ensemble, and they have the um, the Magyar Nemzeti. Uh, which is Jura's group, and then uh, and Duna as well. And 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 just just as, as an aside, there's there's actually quite a lot of dancers in um, the the Alami, the uh, State Folk Ensemble, who danced with Fitosh Deje, so in 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 Santendre, and and I danced with a uh, with a lot of them as well. Uh, so so you could see that the quality of Deje's group is was was incredible and. And they provided a lot of dancers for the for the other professional groups in the in the city and in the country. Did you share the stage with Ahmed Musa? I did. At some point, we um, we had a show in Dior. I forget what we were doing, um, but it was it was this huge over the top show, anyways. Um, and and they brought in a couple of other dancers like Beretz and and Ahmed. But yeah, I did share the stage. Did with he take his shirt off? He took his shirt off, and we all we all like uh, you we applauded. All, we all drooled and applauded. Yeah. <laughs> bass too oh yeah he's a bass player yeah, he is a bass yeah. player yeah. Attila, we're going to ottawa now of course and um and back in 88 1990 those those, those the trips with tilinko uh starting from then you've played probably at every possible hungarian club in canada and, and, and throughout the u.s as well um which one 
maybe back in the old days or or, or even more recently has, has st- stuck out to you as a as a as a cool or interesting uh, place to play uh, if, if, if uh, I can rack your memory well um, the one pops into mind is Kitchener yeah. um, when we arrived of course uh, we were ready to do our usual concert right and uh, as far as I remember there were not many dancers who could do folk dancing right or nape dance so but there were a lot of people they were older folks most of them are you know from the 50s you know from the 56 um, and they definitely expected us to play uh, like um, Nota. I guess notas and which is like the gypsy music from the cities you know these days and uh, we weren't quite prepped for that you guys but, never played that in Hungary uh, no no and actually uh, you know our uh, leader of musical leader of our band Imi you know he would definitely refuse to uh, do that but funny enough the violin player did not so we did play some stuff <laughs> yes you know uh, so that definitely uh, was one place that stood out they still demand that in Kitchener yeah. and Kitchener and, is very nota heavy yeah and I, I, I remember uh, Buffalo being very similar. Oh, yeah, that's right. Ah, you know, the old yeah. Buffalo uh, Hungarian house or whatever. Can we use is that still around? Do we, do we know? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think there's a Hungarian club in, anymore in Buffalo. And apologies to Buffalo if you're listening. And if I got that wrong. I think they might still have the club, but the membership isn't very um, high. Uh, Ottawa's a place as well, which um, uh, Gobi and uh, your sister, uh, Hugi, used to t- t- uh, teach out here. Uh, was a very vibrant uh, dance group uh, with several couples, right? And then, and then they kind of stopped. And then recently, because of uh, Yonta's very own Sylvie uh, uh, Paquette Fritsch and um, and Kuntesh Bori, they've kind of revitalized the group there. And it's a nice youth ensemble uh, back in Ottawa. So yeah, uh, this was a this was a uh, interesting um, uh, issue back in the 80s, 90s with these revival bands like Tilinko um, and beyond, uh, Ukrush, etc., uh, Ustilush, you know, coming here and uh, the 56th uh, generation demanding uh, Hungarian nota be played, this urban music, which was not, not quite the thing that you guys wanted to do or were even good at, to be honest, but you knew all the songs because you grew up with it. Uh, I, I feel that this uh, today's uh, younger generation of revivalists, uh, in fact, gravitate toward that music as well. They have, they have much more respect for it. Like Zodjiva, for instance, I, comes to mind. But they're very happy to play Magyar Notas, you know? Yeah. There, there's a, I, I mean, in, in the Magyar Nota, I mean, I'm not a musician, but uh, what, what I gather is that there's a difficulty aspect to playing the Magyar Nota stuff, or at least some of it. Um, that, that that the musicians really enjoy enjoy doing, I think. Well, but but is it also not true though that the Tansas movement was was it, it was in part a rebellion against a, 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 I don't say rebellion that's a harsh word um, special operation. <laughs> uh, it, it was in part um, set in motion, and the momentum of it was against that establishment of the, the Tsigains and 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 that. You know the big, the big, the sound of the, yeah. you know. Of course, because the Tsigainzene or Nota was actually supported by the government, the state, right? And it was on TV, on radio. Um, of course, you needed a nut, you know, a couple hours every day at noon. You know, they played Magyar Nota, and of course, all the respect to uh, those players. And you're right, playing Magyar Nota the way it should be. You you must be a well thought, classically trained musician. Absolutely. There's no way around it. Uh, on every instrument. Yeah, yeah pretty on much. Every yeah. Instrument. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gobby's phone just rang, and we have very special uh, special guests. They don't even know they're on the program. And uh, this is uh, we're talking about the '80s and '90s, and these two folks were there. Say, uh, this is Lutzi and Nora. Hi, Farkas, Lutzi and Nora. Hello. 
definitely in the 80 90s era. That's for sure. Yeah, Some but. Of us more than others. <laughs> now, why did you call Gubby this morning? Well, Gubby and I talk almost every day, and, and I'm trying to get uh, convinced Nora to do an Albuquerque with us for a little, um, uh, a little dance. Uh, what what is it called? A little dance in New York. All right, for a Punto Zoo, you guys want to do a dance. Okay. Well, that's uh, you know this. You're really interrupting our program, but that's okay. Wow. Special guest callers. Special guest callers. Still dancing after all these years. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's not a call-in show. First time, long time. Hey, Lutzi, real quick. Lutzi. Uh, Yes, uh, how far will Canada go in the World Cup? We want to know. Oh, you know what? I was looking at the uh, the rosters of, the, of all the teams. I think we're going to do pretty good. I think we can beat uh, what Morocco is in there. Uh, and Croatia. Croatia is an aging team. I think we might be able to do well against them. Yes, and, and no one talks about Belgium. <laughs> well, you know what? Belgium is on the same level. As Croatia as being an aging team, yeah, um, they're usually good in the preliminary rounds. But I think Canada, with their youth, I think we can do make some. Uh, we can run around them a little bit. So there you have it. The prediction: We're going to beat all the Asian teams. Oh wait, he said Asian or aging? Aging. Oh, Asian. Oh, okay, aging. Okay, 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 okay. Got it. All right. Thanks for calling in. So we uh, stopped for gas in Kingston, and now we're back. It's snowing again, as it always does after Kingston and before Ottawa. It's very, very odd here on 401. But uh, full tank of gas, did some Tim Hortons, and uh, continuing on the road. Gobi and I go way back. You heard about the 80s, but uh, we, spent, uh, we spent two years together, or one year together in university at Duquesne University in uh, dancing in the, and playing music in the tambourines. Uh, Gobi had a short-lived career there, only two years. But what, what, do you, what are some good things you remember about the tambourines uh, and, and how it impacted your life and your performing uh, career, I guess? Um, well, <laughs> it's, it's actually multi-layered and, and I'm not sure how, how, how deeply we're gonna go into it, but, but just uh, sort of in a, in a sort of cursory way, uh, the 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 whole idea of the tambourines is, is tambourines is is an incredible thing. I think I think the fact that it it exists is 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 something that that helps the sort of East European community um, exist and find its identity in a lot of ways, well, especially in America. Less so in Canada because it doesn't. Um, uh, the tam the Tamis don't impact Canada as, as much, and and the population is a little bit different in Canada, or at least in Toronto, than it is in in some of the um, Midwest uh, Midwest states. But um, but I mean I mean the whole organization is excellent, and the fact that they've been around for such a long time uh, says a lot about their their staying power. And I hope they I hope they um they continue. Uh, I mean we can talk about you know philosophically what I think about it but but I think it's kind of irrelevant um, the fact that they they exist and they're doing what they're doing is 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 something that that's that's so that's an incredible thing um, you were exposed we were exposed collectively to all kinds of different cultures of Eastern and Central Europe in terms of the dance and the music aside from obviously the Hungarian which one did you like doing the most well <laughs> I mean, I mean, I think intuitively, <clears throat> intu intuitively, I would have liked probably the Romanian dances the most, just because um, they're they're very close to the Hungarian Transylvanian dances. However, <clears throat> and this is this is, I guess, the um, not so much critique, but but where where I um, where I differ in 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 my in my philosophy philosophy towards towards folk dancing is that uh, is that the Tamburitsins had a sort of mishmash of, of, of ways of presenting the, the folk dances. Um, the, oh, boy, we see a car, <laughs> police car in the median with a car in the ditch. Oh, boy. All right, Attila, keep it steady, buddy. 
So <clears throat> uh, their their interpretation of Romanian folk dancing mainly came from um, the Moldova State Folk Ensemble, which is which is one degree separated from from Romania. I know that Moldova used to belong to more belong to Romania as Bessarabia, but uh, but uh, that's sort of historical. But but Moldova was was more was more a part of the the Soviet style, the Moseyev um, style of dancing. And the Moldova State Folk Ensemble really, really presented Romanian dances in, a, in an incredibly stylistic way. And when, when the Tamburitsons brought it on stage, it was, it, was, it was one or two degrees separated from the original. The interpretation of it was a little bit, maybe a little bit watered down, although I, I think we did a pretty good job uh, doing it on the stage. The only problem I had with it was that, was that it wasn't, it, it's not what they dance in the village. And, and which is fine. I think if 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 Uchi would have um, or Kaman, sorry, if Uchi's if Kaman would have um, would have asked me these questions thirty years ago, I I would have probably probably be a little bit more militant with my with my answers. Uh, now I've 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 grown to appreciate the Moseyev style. I think it's I, I mean, looking at some of the stuff is I think it's incredible. Um, the technique and the and the um, and and the uh, the the dancers who dance those those dances are are just out of this world. Like I I would never be able to do anything like that, and I have the deepest respect for for that style of dancing when it's done properly, and uh, and so the problem I guess I had with with the Tamburitsons approach was that that it was kind of a mishmash. There wasn't there wasn't a a, a set sort of philosophy. That said, okay, now we're we're gonna do Mosoyev style, or we're gonna do completely um, authentic style, and it and it became it, it becomes problematic just because you have to have you, you have to wear hats in 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 sort of different um, uh, different approaches. So so it, I guess it wasn't so much that it was problematic; it was just that that if you're if you're into one one type of dancing and then you have to do the other one, it, it becomes a little bit uh, a little bit less. Uh, less fun to do I'm not sure uh, so so itchy you asked me what what was my favorite dance to do and I went into a bit of a diatribe there uh, I I would have liked the Romanian dances but I gave you my answer for that uh, the the other dance that I that I grew to really appreciate which was which was a little bit stylized but maybe not so much as the Romanian was was the Bulgarian I mean I was absolutely um, absolutely like astounded by the Bulgarian stuff and and you know I tried to do do my best I'm sure I wasn't wasn't uh, the, among the best dancers there when, when it came to this style but but I certainly had a lot of fun when we were doing the Bulgarian stuff and and there was and and in the music the music had this sort of like Gimash in a way although the Bulgarian stuff is very melodic but it had it had that quality um, that you that you have in Gimash where it's like this primordial sort of um, uh, sound especially when when you hear the harmonics and the singing um, it kind of it kind of um, makes you shiver a little bit so uh, so I would say I would probably say that that I that I enjoyed the Bulgarian uh, the most out of yeah. after after the Hungarian yeah I would say the same I loved playing it playing it you were usually dancing I was usually playing although we did share a Speaking of Romania, we danced the Mekareki top shosh together, uh, which was great. Uh, did we do the Lekinesh too? No, no, it was just the, just yeah. the Mekareki. Yeah. Um, so it was, uh, it was a long time ago now, 30 years ago, imagine. Yeah. And the little known fact is, um, is uh, Gobi and I uh, hosted a, on the Duquesne student radio station, we hosted the so-called folk show. Uh, which was uh, every week for two hours we would spin records as they were then uh, and run some ads as we had to um, and that was the pre-podcasting uh, Uchi back then with Gobi and after you left uh, the Tambertsons uh, I continued that show with uh, Andri, <coughs> a Chibik uh, great Ukrainian friend so those were good times um, Attila you, uh, when, uh, when you came uh, to live in Canada in 1992, um, I guess a few years in, you started to play with uh, with Fekete Food, a band that came up uh, earlier uh, in our conversation. Uh, we we're talking to Gobi about the first Tansazes in the 80s, um, and of course uh, Fekete Food, uh, led by the 
Vershegi brothers, uh, Arpi and, and, and Gobi, um, they're both still uh, uh, involved somewhat in music and, and dance in, in Toronto. Um, but that was a quite a different change from Tilinko, I'd imagine. What was it like back then in the 90s playing with them and, and, uh, and, and your relationship with the, with the Fekata Food guys? Well, just for the record, uh, I came in 91 and then for quite a few years, because of geographic reasons, I wasn't playing much. I lived in the high Arctic on the Baffin Island. But then when I came down, yes, I got the, uh, the invite from uh, Gergay to come down one Friday. They get together every Friday and just come down and have fun, which I certainly did. You know, the, the first thing is to have a couple of palinkas before you say hi. And then, um, yes, they played um, quite differently. Uh, fantastic musicians in that band, of course. Uh, the Primash and so on, he's a great classical musician. Um, but they did prefer the what we mentioned previous to the nota, the city gypsy music. Um, that is how they grew up. They listened to that. Um, obviously, I don't know if you know, but Gergay family moved to South America first, and then moved up to Canada. And yeah, from Venezuela, I think. Yeah, yeah and and I guess. They all listen to these old records, you know, and anytime you can catch some radio shows, you know, back in the, mm -hmm. from the old country. So they preferred that. And it actually took quite a few years of, well, I was there for a few years. By the time I convinced them initially, well, Arby was the hardest, of course, <laughs> to uh, do a two, three day weekend in Niagara to play for a camp which was only traditional village music, folk music. And uh, of course, the, uh, his biggest um, thing against it was that, you know, I, I don't want to play for three hours nonstop, right? Um, he had his breaks after every, you know, 10, 12 minutes, had to have another palinka and a smoke. Union, uh, union break. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> union breaks. And uh, so, yeah, but it was a very interesting time and I, I wholly enjoyed it. And actually, funny enough, you know, it did open me up more to that style of playing. And I do enjoy it a lot lately. I, I kind of self-teaching myself at home, you know, with YouTube and other um, things I can get on the internet. Um, and I seriously went myself at home back to as much as I know, uh, more a classical style playing and trying to understand this nota. I get I, when you send clips uh, around uh, to us, it's usually a nota uh, yeah. band from Hungary or something um, in Budapest in the cafes. So, was it the Cifra Tabor you're talking about? Yes, correct, in Niagara Falls, yeah, the Cifra camp. Uh, that went for decades. It's still on. I believe, though, that location's been changed. Yeah, location's been changed. Yeah, but uh, yeah. So, so when you joined them, was it mid late nineties, something like that? Yeah, it would have would have been very late nineties. Um, and uh, of course, they had a bass player, so you know, I wasn't hundred percent needed. But I joined in, and then of course we had a concert. Which was, I'm just trying to slow down at the moment. Just so you guys know, it's completely ice, snow, and we're slowed down to <laughs> 60, 60 K an hour on the 401. It's a disaster. I hate driving out here in the winter, but it's not even winter. It's like November, mid-November. This is nuts. Yeah. Anyway, I, I always say never again. I hear you. Yeah. It's so quiet. It's like the car has stopped. Yeah, and the funny fact, again, that... You know, when I was playing at Cifra with Fekatafield, one uh, camp, that's where actually I, I really met Levy, mm -hmm. my favorite contra player at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> right, and there there was even, wasn't there a camp where Eiletfa played together with you guys? 
There's some yeah, mix. There was. Yeah. There was some sort of a, I don't know if it was a, a long weekend or a camp, and he let for us there, yes. Hecky and the rest, right? Yeah. And then we played, yes. Uh, yeah, that, that was a fun weekend, as much as I remember. You know. <laughs> Uh, Gobi, back when you lived in in Hungary, um, you had we were doing a radio show. I think it's a radio show, right? Get the folk out. Was it what, what? What was that about? It's the precursor to Tansas talk, of course, but and the and, the and postcursor the post, yeah, to yeah, yeah. Uh, to the folk show. <laughs> uh, but get the folk out. That's right. What was it? What was that on? Well, it was. So I worked at the Fono, and um, there was a radio station above us called the Civil Radio, and uh, they. They needed um, they needed some shows and and I said well I can do I can do a show but it would be in English and and they said oh that would be great we can we can probably sell it to <clears throat> sell it to other other shows and or rather other radio stations across Europe I, it never really happened but but it was it was always it was always in the works uh, sometimes sometimes Martin Farago Marzi would would join me and <clears throat> the name of the the show was get the folk out with with uh, Gobi and Marzi, or Marzi and Gobi, I forget whose name was first. Um, and we we tried to interview people who, who knew English, so a little bit like a cheese show. Um, and and it was it was it was quite interesting. Uh, usually it was it was people who who came from North America to visit visit Budapest, and we got them on the show to to talk a little bit. But sometimes we got musicians like Unger Bolaj. Uh, was interviewed at some point. Grand Pierre Attila, uh, those of you who are in the folk punk genre know about Grand Pierre Attila. Also, he's a, an astronomer as well, so you get these interesting, um, di you get this interesting diversity from post-communist countries, you know, like the punk scene is is usually uh, with a bunch of astronomers. You know? <laughs> it's different from the North American punk scene. Right. Um, so so those, were, those were kind of interesting. Um, uh, interviews, but it was it was always a little bit challenging because because you know you wanted to interview these these interesting people, but it was limited because we 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 uh, did our interviews in English and we we needed to find um, the right people for that. I think I think maybe even Aaron Dash Peter came on our show at some point, uh, and and that was that was my time when I was at the Fono. So the Fono. Um was the is the is the the current place where the Fono is right, um, which I think I think we could all say it's kind of like a game changing place, right? I mean, they they did all the, the we patrio stuff, you know, the the uh, capturing some of the last possible field recordings. Um, they had a, they had like every week they would bring a different band from Transylvania there and and, and record things. You were you were there for all that time period when um, that was going on. I was there for part of it, I guess. Uh, so I went to I went to the musical instrument shop in Budapest. I forget what it's called. Shoot, it's the one that Holokui Lajos uh, runs. Yeah. Just um, I guess Marcibanyter or whatever. Uh, and and I went in because I I really like visiting his uh, his um, his shop. And we got to talking, and he said, "Wouldn't you like to work at the Fono?" And then I said, "Wouldn't I?" <laughs> so, so <laughs> I began working at the Fono. It was that easy, uh, and I became the sort of resident um, graphic artist and sort of event planner too. Uh, they had they had the Tansas there, but it was it was sort of a limited Tansas. They had they had Cheek, um, they had Cheek, Teka, and and Meta playing uh, sort of interchangeably mm. and and it was kind of limited um, Chavanu who's unfortunately died recently uh, he was the one that was was teaching teaching the 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 dances before the actual dance has happened and the and the crowd was um, a little bit aging it wasn't very dynamic so I, I suggested that we we completely revamp the dance has at the Fono. And I got to talking with um, Fito Dejeu, and we we made this um, we made this huge uh, uh, huge uh, undertaking where where for two months it would be it would be different teachers. So we had like Dejeuic, we had uh, Florier come in. I think maybe even Nazi, um, Shikentans uh, came in as well. Uh, so and everybody did a different different dialect. I think Fito Sheikh did uh, 
did Santivani probably I'm I, I don't remember uh, she can dance did um, uh, uh, Silad Shaggy so it was it was sort of interspersed like that and and the last the last uh, Wednesday because it was on Wednesdays the last Wednesday would be a, a, a sort of like a bal so we wouldn't, didn't even call it a tansaz because really tansaz it was only called in sake a tansaz and so we called it a bal and we would bring we would bring the uh, musicians and dancers from the region that was being taught and it would be a, a huge a huge um, a huge uh, bully and and the tansaz was incredible like so many people came it, it, the the revamping of the tansaz was just it was so successful that uh, that it was continued like at some point unfortunately um, Luyo, who is the uh, owner of the of the Fono, fired everyone. So even me, but it, but they kept me on because because I was the one that uh, sort of revamped the Tansa. So they kept me on a little bit, uh, and and it continued in the same format even after I left. So so it was really 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 successful. And I don't understand why they didn't do it before. It's still um, going on. It's yeah, the same yeah, exact yeah. format so, going on. Yeah, when Beretz Pichu yes. took over, he he continued yeah. this format. And and I just remember it being incredibly successful. Obviously, um, Dejo helped because because uh, he's De what Dejo is really good at is if you tell him if you tell him your idea, he really follows through on 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 putting it putting it from paper to 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 um practical. So he's he's a really good good guy to work with something like that because he's able to conceptualize things like that and and bring it bring it to um bring it to uh, to life. Uh, so, so that was that was a really really fun time that I had there creating this this whole whole experience. I mean, we we oh and the bands too. So it wasn't just Take, it wasn't just Cheek and Meta anymore, which I think they were a little bit pissed off that that I changed the four. But um, and it's hard because you know the, the, you're you're sort of you're sort of um, screwing screwing with people's livelihoods when you do stuff like that, and it's a little bit difficult. But but each each um, each teacher brought their own own musicians to the um, to the tansas, and the musicians were were the ones that were more geared towards that uh, towards that uh, dialect that was being taught, mm -hmm. and and I th I thought it was really well done and and uh, and yeah it yeah. was it was a really good good thing. Interesting side note is um, my son Shoma, who is spending the eleventh grade in in Budapest. Is studying at the Obuda uh, Folk Music School with Horvat Attila, um, and every Wednesday they go to the Fono um, to play uh, for the the dance teaching, and and the focus for the last several weeks has been Sas Chavash. So they it's a part of extracurricular extra training for them on top of their regular lessons, uh, which has been really really uh, cool. So thanks for starting that, Gobi, so many years ago, uh, so my son can appreciate it and and, and take part in it. Attila, you um, you've been, um, I guess the 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 base the appointed bass player for several musical duos that have come from Hungary over the years um, for for different events. So they bring a violinist and a contra player, and then you become the third wheel, so to speak, uh, the, the 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 bass player. Um, who are you? Who who can you like? If you could relive one of those uh, little mini tours of playing with. With one of these appointed uh, duos, who might it be? Oh, well, it, it's hard to pick one, but um, one of the first one was who came back a few times, and I played with them weddings and short camps and longer camps. Um, was Gajo and Arandash, of course, mm -hmm. and um, I think I learned quite a bit from uh, Gajo and Arandash, thankfully. Um, but I enjoyed when they actually managed to bring um, even, f you mentioned Sas Chavash weekend, right? For your son, when Dumnezu and Shanyi, they were coming out from Sas Chavash, they had the weekend in, in Montreal. I had the pleasure of playing with them. Mm -hmm. I also played with Kishchipash, right? Yeah. A couple of camps and, and weekends and stuff like that. that that's. That's pretty much unforgettable for me, you know, all those guys. And then, of course, the revival, of, you know, pre marches like uh, Hamosh Otilo, we were talking about him a little bit earlier, Chiga, with the crush. Um, I had a chance to play with uh, Kohn's Gergay quite a few times, even when he played Bracha. And, and I think that was 
one of the most interesting for me as a bass player playing with Gergő. Why? Um, I think it's his approach to music. This whole, whole, um, I guess he's more than a hundred percent in the music. Like he's just when when he starts to play, it's that's all what there is, which it, sh uh, it should be. But he's more so than anyone else. I I played with you know in a band, um, and then of course playing with village musicians are incredible. You know every time I have a chance. Um, so with Kotskerger, uh, when he plays the contra, let's say you say he's completely uh, you'd say absorbed into the music, okay. and 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 how does that manifest itself, or how do you notice that? Is it just the intensity of the playing, or is it just you know, he's, he's kind of in another world in his eyes. What do you see? Yeah, I think what happens is it's almost like what sometimes you hear in the media from jazz musicians or so on. So when you start to play and then you are just an autopilot, I'd say, like you don't have to think anymore. It just happens. You are completely in that moment. Um, not that I would ever remember or think about poor chord progressions you know as a bass player but um, but uh, it just happens and and it's so easy you know to play with uh, with a bracha player like like him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you mentioned that and Dash Peter and Gaja yeah. and that you learned a lot from them uh, uh, what what kind of things did you learn uh, from them even at your well, you know your grandfather now at your advanced mm -hmm. age you can still learn things that's good to hear mm -hmm. Good to know, but what uh, what kind of what, what are some examples of things that you learned from, let's say, playing with Peter and Gaja? Um, again, of course, they are super focused on what they are doing, and uh, for many reasons, as a bass player, I obviously didn't have. I would just maybe this is not the right word, but a freedom. I exactly had to play what they required almost like when you play with the village musicians uh there is no deviation you know you can't really play uh another note you know between an a and e you know which yeah. is pretty, getting pretty boring sometimes yeah. for a bass player um so they require exactly uh what you have to play and uh because they are so connected and they just want to sound exactly as it sounded on that original recording, mm -hmm. right? Well, you don't get that from me, Attila. Don't worry. <laughs> I have, I'm not very discerning or demanding in that regard <laughs> as a violinist. <laughs> but I fun. I have a nice car. You can you can but, drive it. Yeah, exactly. But the other thing is, you know, learning from like Peter, you know, Doctor Doctor Arandash um, is he's not that kind of doctor. And it was very interesting because I was not conscious about that in the past. I just knew that with some contra, bracha, viola players, we gel, you know, like we can play very well. Uh, like when Ochi plays bracha, it's pretty easy to play with him. But I learned a lot about the bowing of being how synchronous it is mm -hmm. on original recordings uh, from Peter. Um, how much it has to be exactly on the how would I put it the the emphasize you know certain parts of the bow uh, you cannot be even like a, a slightly off which of course most people wouldn't notice you know and in Tansaj you just play as you you know as it comes but they are always super focused on that you know like how the the bowing is and it makes a huge difference of course what are you guys uh, Attila what are you watching right now or, or, or reading it's a uh... Uh, in terms of a show or a book, uh, just curious. Yeah, actually, f funny you mention a book. Um, actually, beside my bed now, there is a book, which was the official teaching material for the Royal Conservatory about uh, Renaissance music. Oh, cool! And I, I just found that book at like a, you know one of those garage sale book, you know, dollar books, you know, leave some money here kind of thing. And uh, yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm reading at the moment. So you're reading about Renaissance music. Yeah. Um, what was basically the pre presented at the Royal Conservatory? You know, mm -hmm. as as they were giving lectures, right? I guess that was the giving home material. It was yeah. like a, a book, maybe like 150 pages, and uh, bringing up 
um, all from, of course, Western Europe um, from the, uh, the point of view of, you know, like uh, they're bringing up a lot of music from, uh, you know, France and so on, so on, Germany and that style, in the, and of course Italy, right? Renaissance music, um, and it's very interesting because um, I had discussions, some limited discussions with um, Doctor, you know, Arendash, um, because uh, you know he was always mentioning where this music is originating, you know, briefly, which is that era, right, mm -hmm. the Renaissance era. So the you're talking about uh, the Transylvanian village music mainly. Right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, that music and even the instruments and how they used them, you know, what bows they used. Uh, obviously, everybody had got strings, even on the violin back then and so on. And um, now it kind of made sense, certain facts that I just heard, you know, even in Hungary, that when they went to uh, record a, a village musician and on his uh, bracha, he still had got strings, mm -hmm. which was very rare. Wow, that's you know? rare. And, uh, of course, they didn't have the ability to, there was no money, you know, to buy another one. They are very expensive nowadays. So he, he had to switch to metal strings and stuff like that. And that, 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 that whole picture kind of makes sense, you know? That's very cool. You know, we have the group, um, the famous orchestra in Toronto called Tafel Music, and they still use, they use Baroque um, age instruments with gut strings, and they're, they don't tune to 440, they tune to whatever, yeah, it's uh, they, lower. lower, they yeah, turn it down. Better. Yeah, um, which is which is interesting. Uh, Gobi, you what are you aside from the internet and Facebook Messenger? <laughs> what what are you uh, reading or, or watching currently? Uh, well, before before I um, before I uh, say anything about that, I just wanted to mention that, uh, and only because I I worked with uh, Itchy's father on this. Um, we did we did uh, after um, after my time at the Fono. I, I needed to do some something Hungarian folk oriented, and uh, we came up with this uh, with uh, with this idea to do a, 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 a talent search program in in Hungary called Folk Beats. Folk Beats. And this was before the uh, the the Felszállott a Pava uh, program that came on after. In fact, we were we were um, also um, uh, uh, filmed by the Duna TV, so we were. We were there with Duna as well, and we were almost almost signed on by Duna, uh, but but it just didn't it didn't work out in the end. Uh, and uh, the the winners of Folk Beats, there were 99 uh, uh, entries. Entries. Uh, it was uh, in two categories: so authentic folk music and world music. And the winners the winners got got to tour uh, North America. So. So that was that was a lot of fun. I was on the tour with um, the Magos uh, Magos group, uh, who won the um, authentic folk music, and then Gasus Maida Maria. I don't know how to pronounce her. I never know how to pronounce her name. Um, she won. She won the the. I guess she won. She won the authentic music as well. And then um, oh shoot, who Mesa won the Mesa Chinka? That's it. Uh, yeah, Bilyoski, Emil, and and yeah, his. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if they're together anymore, but I think they, I think they still have their group. Mm -hmm. uh, in any event, they were they were out and they they um, they did a little bit of tour of a tour in in North America. Do you think? Uh, I know you're not watching that, but do you think Fersalo Topavo was inspired somewhat? by folk beats? Because I know first at the Pavo existed in the 70s or 60s, whatever, right? right? I mean, and then it stopped. And then it then it was re, de, uh, re, revamped. Uh, do you know if there was any relationship there, any inspiration maybe that came? And are you owed money for that? <laughs> you need a lawyer right away. You know what? <laughs> Litigation pending, don't speak anymore. No. <laughs> well, I don't think we inspired anyone. I think, I think it was always in the back of their minds. Uh, the one thing that we may have um, contributed is is that they saw how successful folk beats was. There was this incredible incredible amount of um, bands who who um, who applied for it, and I think they saw that that there might be an opportunity there. I think they were already thinking about doing something like that fast out of the pavo already. They just weren't they just weren't um, 
sure if it was going to be something that that could be sustainable or successful. And um, and, yeah. and and you know whatever. I mean, you, you do things because you want to do it, not because you want to be financially successful at it. Uh, that would be a little bit cynical. Um, the point is, is that Fast Salo to Pavo, Pavo is, is is an incredible. Um, uh, contest for for the people there and in Slovakia I think they're they're doing a similar one and and there's a lot of lot of parallels um, between what's happening in Slovakia and Hungary which is a really good thing in the dance house movement do you um do you uh, know I mean I, f- I forgot 99 contestants signed up that's amazing for folk beats but do you know if the impetus uh, the driving force was they wanted to come to the US and Canada to tour or was it just exposure for something different so we we did we did a we did a a, a similar thing uh, talent search thing in at the Fono but uh, I don't know for some reason I didn't like the the format that they did that they did at the Fono and now now after after being fired from the Fono I had the freedom to 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 do it the way I wanted to do it although I didn't get a chance to do it exactly the way I wanted to do it but I was hoping that it would be just more than just the one one season that we did uh, but I think I think it's because it was it was like a it was it was a big 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 deal mm-hmm. um, I think I think the the draw the the concert in or the the touring in North America I think that was a draw but but I think the 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 musicians saw an opportunity here to get some sort of exposure as well the internet was still it not I'm sorry not in its infancy right. but but the social media part of the internet was still in its infancy and there were there were there were a lot of opportunities there for for bands and I think we tried to capitalize on it a little bit and they saw that and I think that's that also helped as well you you hosted it was it um it was on YouTube or how I forget how it was visible oh yeah we we also had um yeah we also put it on YouTube and we also had jury we we also had a jury from um from North America as well yeah, uh, I, and you were part I was of that as well yeah, yeah. 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 So. Um, so, what are you watching or reading? Stop stalling. <laughs> so, uh, we were talking about this earlier. Uh, I'm, I'm listening to some Canadian sort of folk music on, on, on YouTube and... Uh, uh, oh, shoot. Stan Rogers is, is the name before I forget. I always forget names. I'm not very good with names. Mm-hmm. So, Stan Rogers, uh, he was a, a folk singer. And not, not this sort of authentic folk singer, but he does really... Um, uh, grab a lot of stuff from from like this archive material I'm sure that he has access to but he makes his own stuff up so he's he's a writer singer songwriter I guess but in the folk genre and and his stuff is just just absolutely awesome I, I really like singing to it I, I try to look for the um the Stan Rogers karaoke stuff on on YouTube and then I try to sing it but uh, that's that's what I'm listening to and if you get a chance um, uh, Barrett's privateers are or um, uh, uh, the, the Northwest Passage is a really good. That's that's mm-hmm. that's my favorite one. In any event, Stan Rogers, look for it. Um, what I'm not reading any anything folk oriented, but I'm a huge Herman Hesse fan, uh, a, a sort of German postmodernist um, writer. Uh, and the book that I'm actually reading now is Steppenwolf, kind of a kind of a psychedelic book a lot of uh, the people in the 60s really really latched onto it although although he he claims that the people in the 60s didn't really understand it I think he was still alive in the 60s I'm not sure um, in any event um, so Herman Hesse that's who I'm reading uh, what, what am I watching I'm not sure what I'm watching you're watching uh, YouTube uh, Stan Rogers Stan Rogers and the, that's what I watch and the privateers that's exactly what I'm doing. so this now we are uh, we, well there's no one well it doesn't matter someone's kind of there yeah, uh, we are now flying at 30k an hour, and uh, on a complete whiteout disaster. By the way, I am reading a book on venture capital called Power Law, and I am watching. We were just finished watching Billions, um, great show, and uh, and now started watching season five of The Crown, which is great. Oh, Billions, I saw that. That that is a really good show. Yeah, Billions, <laughs> Billions is great. I'm, I, that's what I'm watching with my wife on my own. Uh, when she falls asleep at 7.45, I watch um, uh, Game of Thrones right now. I know we're way behind, but uh, I'm watching Game of Thrones, which is kind of weird and, and, and interesting. 
at the same time. Um, and yeah, that's it. So, so if we ever make it, uh, <laughs> you'll uh, we'll, we'll we'll check back later. And maybe play some music as well uh, from tonight. done with the uh, Ottawa gig Hans has at the Ottawa Hungarian house it's uh, past midnight and uh, we are we made it safely and now we are on the way back to Toronto we've opted to drive overnight and uh, the good news is it's snowing again uh, just for a change <laughs> it's been snowing the whole time but uh, so we're about to get back on the the mighty 406 416 to the 401 heading back home and we should be home in about uh, four or five hours uh, so some of us because I live in Toronto but Attila needs to go all the way back to St. Catharines and of course Gubby lives uh, in Toronto as well so uh, we arrived and it was uh, we had a nice music workshop um, Attila taught some bass players and and uh, Levy taught contra to, uh, to some people and uh and I, and I taught uh, uh, several of the children a violin, and my daughter Chenga, who was there from Montreal, she taught the uh, the beginner violins. It was a, it was nice to see um, a lot of musicians coming out of Ottawa, which was a very nice revelation. Attila, what do you uh, what do you think uh, about tonight and how it all went? I think it was really well attended. I heard from some of the organizers that uh, they saw people who uh, was back 20 years later tonight. Including uh, one of Yonta's founding musicians, uh, Shogi. What's his actual name? Uh, Andras. Andras uh, I his last name. Yeah. Do you remember his last name? He's from Attila's uh, town of Sekeshvehevar. Um, Shogi. Shogi. So he used to play violin and some Contra too. And um, it was nice to see him and some other some other truly old friends. Gobi, your uh, your impressions coming back to Ottawa? Um, yeah, it was fun. Uh, I mean, I, I used to teach the group when, uh, when they were a lot smaller, uh, maybe back in 1993, 94, uh, with my sister. Um, and it was good seeing all the people who who I remember from from all the way back, and uh, Loppy and his wife were there as well. Uh, he was originally from London, actually, and he had a, he he was uh, teaching a dance group in London when I got to know him. But then he moved to Ottawa, and and I didn't recognize him at all because I don't remember him, or I didn't remember him with a mustache. But it was it was it was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, and it was really um, a lot of. It's very family centric. There are a lot of kids, their parents, and uh, and and I think that was nice. And they have nice Debrecen and Nikolbas selection as well. So, so uh, Attila and Gobi, thanks for uh, sharing this time together. And I think it was a really, a really good use of, of, of time uh, to, to to chat some on the road. And hopefully, we'll do uh, these types of uh, types of episodes uh, again because it's nice to uh, nice to use the time wisely. And constructively. So, thanks, guys, and hopefully, if if you hear this episode, it means we made it home safely, <laughs> <laughs> or someone found the phone and put it on for us. <laughs> That's dark. <laughs> well, that is the episode. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that little new format. Thank you to uh, Gobi and Attila for joining me on the trip we did make it safely sound, uh, safe and sound back home to toronto although it was not easy it took forever a very slow trip back and uh thank you to the uh apple team th the iphone folks for designing the iphone onto which i recorded this conversation with the guys so uh, until next time this is kalman wajaruchi and uh thank you for tuning in mm -hmm.